Hi, and welcome to module 9 of a brief introduction to game theory. In this module, we're going to discuss bounded rationality. Bounded rationality is the study of what happens and what to do about um, violations of rationality assumptions. Remember, our rational choice assumptions were twofold. One, individuals had complete and transitive preferences, and two, individuals could make optimal decisions given their preferences and the constraints that they were under. However, even though we've been using those rational choice assumptions throughout, in real life, individuals often violate those assumptions. The examples we gave before about this were chess and go, two games that were so complex that individuals couldn't behave optimally no matter how hard they tried. Computers can't even do that as of yet. But there are other examples that don't require really complex scenarios. Think of what you do when you go to a supermarket and see a wall full of cereals. Do you behave optimally, which means you have these preferences over all possible pair pairings of cereals, and these preferences are transitive, and you very carefully gather all information you need to make the optimal decision over those cereals? Or do you use a rule of thumb, such as relying upon a recommendation from a friend, or thinking about what, what cereal was good for you the last time you bought cereal, and sticking with that one? Most people will choose the second one because they don't want to put all this time and effort into choosing cereals. Um, these rules of thumb are called heuristics, and they're ways to help us make decisions efficiently um, and quickly without too much effort. There's a huge body of literature on heuristics and what they are and how they work and how they help us sometimes. Um, the, one of the heuristics I used in the previous example of serial was the heuristic of satisficing, which was a term invented by Herb Simon, um, Nobel Prize winner um, in econ, psychology, and political science and other disciplines. Um, if he's part of those disciplines, um, in which you basically have an aspiration level for how much you expect from some outcome. If whenever you achieve that outcome, um, it reaches the aspiration level, you stick with what got you there in the first place. So if your cereal was good for you in the past, you stick with it. If, it was, if at some point in the future it becomes not good enough for you, you try to find a different cereal. That's just one of many possible heuristics, and there's a big body of literature on how they can work well for us. There's also a big body of related literature on how they introduce biases um, to our behavior that can either harm us or harm others. We're not going to get into those different heuristics and bias literature. It's a very interesting literature, a very big one. Um, and if you look thinking about things to, to model yourself that incorporate these boundedly rational um, ideas, they're a good place to start. Instead, we're going to focus on how games in, um, that we see in game theory, just using the kind of um, tools we've been developing so far, can lead to um, violations in the rationality assumptions when played in real life. A nice analogy for that was also given by Herb Simon, which is Simon's scissors. A scissor requires two blades to, um, to cut. In this case, there are two aspects of the scissors that both have to be true in order to get bounded rationality to hold, to be relevant. The first is cognitive constraints. A cognitive constraint just means you don't have the time or interest or to put in the effort and thought, the cognition, level of cognition, to really work out the optimal decision to a problem. Um, that could be because it's just too hard and you don't want to bother, like chess or go, or it could be because you just don't want to put the timing because you have other things you want to do, like the seal example. The second blade of the scissors is the task environment. The task environment is um, how difficult the problem is. It might be the case that you have a very um, strong cognitive constraints and you don't want to put time into this at all, but you just know the answer really easily because it's an easy problem, right? Once you do the prisoner's dilemma 3,000 times, you know you're supposed to defect immediately. And so you behave optimally, even though you don't think about it at all, right? So the cognitive constraints by themselves isn't, isn't enough. You need to be constrained cognitively, but also have a difficult enough task environment that the constraints begin to bind. So a game like chess or go is obviously a um, difficult task environment because no one can deal with that. But even the serial, the serial example, in which um, there's a lot of serials, it becomes it, the level of, of attention you're willing to pay becomes binding. In contrast, you might take the same level of attention, but if there are only two serials, you might make the optimal choice because the task environment is just simple enough that even your very low level of, cognitive, um, of cognition you're willing to put into this decision, it's enough for you. You're willing to sort of go along with that. Okay. Um, so, so you, in general, expect to see bounded rationality mattering when you are cognitively constrained and um, you have a difficult um, task environment. Okay. 
So how does this come up in real life? Um, it doesn't require really complex games or weird serial examples to make this work. And I'm going to show you two games in which this matters. The first is um, Centipede. Centipede is a game that looks like this. And I should um, make sure I have the payoffs in front of me because there's a lot of them and I don't remember them off the top of my head. There you go. Okay, so um, Centipede is a game that looks like this. Player one has a choice between continuing and stopping. If player one stops, player one gets 0.4, so 40 cents, and player two gets 10 cents. If player one continues onward, then there's two options. Player two can continue or stop. If player two stops, then player two gets, then player one gets 20 cents, and player two gets 80 cents. If player two continues, then player one has a choice. Player one can continue or stop, and you can see where this is going. Um, if player one continues, player one gets $1.60, whereas player two gets 40 cents. If player one continues, then player two gets a choice again to stop or continue, as before. If player two stops, then player two gets 0.8, sorry, player one gets 0.8, 80 cents, and player two gets 3.20. If player two continues, then player one gets to go again and gets $6.40, and player one gets $1.60, sorry, player two gets $1.60. If player one continues, then there's a final decision to be made by player two of continue or stop. The stop gets player two, player one, 3.20, and player two, 12.80. And a continue gets player one, 25.60, and player two, 6.40. Now the first question here, as you should always do when you're dealing with bounded rationality, is to figure out what the rational decision would be first. What should the player do rationally? Well, we can use backward induction. This is a sequential game, so we can use backward induction. In the last period, we're comparing um, player two's payoffs. We compare the payoff over here, 640, to the payoff over here, which is 1280. 1280 is better than 640, so player two should stop when this node is reached. Now we work back a step. Player one can continue, in which case player one knows that player two being rational will choose to stop, in which case player one will get 320, or player one can stop and get 640. Um, so obviously player one should stop being rational. We go back another step. Player two can decide between continuing, knowing that player one will then stop, getting player two 160, or stop immediately and get 320. 320 is better than 160, so player two should stop. Back one more step. Player one can continue and get 80 cents or stop immediately and get $1.60, so player one should stop. Back one more step. Player two um, should can continue and get 40 cents or stop and get 80 cents, so player two should stop. And of course, in the, final, the first stage, player one can continue, in which case player two will stop and player one gets 20 cents, or player one can stop immediately and get 40 cents, so player one stops immediately. And the outcome of this game is the payoff pair 40 cents and 10 cents. And the equilibrium is you stop whenever you have an opportunity to stop. Because remember, for a sequential game, you must tell the, anal the analyst must tell what the equilibrium is after every history. And in this case, after every history, you stop. Whoever has the option to go stops. Now, that's the optimum choice. This is the Nash equilibrium, the subgame perfect Nash equilibrium of this game, the only one. But it should strike you as kind of odd, right? Because if you all went through the end of the game, you'd both do way better off, right? Not even a little better off, massively better off. And yet, it's rational to stop now. So what's going on there? Well, if you play this game in the lab, um, what you see is that, and these payoffs were taken from a lab game, um, you see that individuals delay stopping. They continue for a while, usually um, two or three times to see how long, two to four times, to see, you know, in the hopes that their opponent will behave the same irrational, or big air quotes there, irrational way, and, um, and continue as well, so that we get to higher payoffs. Now, it doesn't seem so rational on the surface, right? If you just wait, if you just continued, then maybe to here, even if player one stopped, they'd get massively higher payoffs, right? Even if player one believes player two would only continue one time, Player one would be have double the payoff, right? All player two has to do is continue one time to get player one a payoff 
at least as high as double the original payoff player one had. Right? So it seems not so risky if you just rely upon the fact that your opponent is also going to decide to abandon sort of optimal behavior and behave a little bit irrationally. Um, so in practice, people don't play this game with perfect rationality because it seems like it's good not to do that, and it seems like there's good payoffs in the future if you just kind of wait for them, right? If you just kind of violate the rationality assumptions and just go for it, you might be, get a, be able to get higher payoffs, and they often do in the lab. So that's one example in which individuals choose, choose not to, to use backward induction optimally and instead just kind of go for it. Um, a second example I want to mention briefly um, is I want to call it a guessing game. It's also called a beauty pageant game or a Keynesian beauty pageant game. Um, there are a lot of variety to this game. I just had lots of games before, kind of sexist. So I'm using guessing game right here. The names are sexist. Um, I'm using guessing game here. And the idea is this. Each individual has a um, choice to guess between 0 and 100 inclusive. You have to use whole numbers or integers here, not um, fractions or whatever. So you can guess between 0 and 100. And the game works like this. All the people who guess, we average all their guesses we take two-thirds of that number, and whoever has a guess close to the two-thirds of the average of everyone wins the prize, and we assume you want the prize. So how should this game work? Well, first, people have to have some notion of, of what they believe the average is. And since we're all kind of rational here, we're all the same person, we should all have the same beliefs if we start from the same initial beliefs. Um, so let's say we all believe the average is 50. Well, what's two-thirds of 50? Two-thirds of 50 is 100 divided by uh, uh, 3, which is 33 and a third. Right. Um, let's, let's, keep that, let's just put that at, at 33 to make life easier. So I know that two-thirds of, uh, of, of, my, of my guess of 50 is 33. Well, um, I should then guess optimally 33 or and a third, whatever, 33, right? Um, but I also know everyone's rational, which means everyone's going to guess 33. But then, in that case, the average isn't 50, it's 33. Now, if everyone guesses 33, then I should guess two-thirds of that, which is 22. And then I would win. But wait, everyone knows that the average of 33 is the, is the average is 33. So everyone's going to guess 22, so the average is actually 22. But wait, the two-thirds of that, and so on and so forth, right? Um, so what's going to happen is this process is going to continue downward until eventually we get to zero. And the equilibrium of this game is going to be zero, and we all get zero. Now that might strike you as weird, right? You have a choice between zero and 100. You all get zero for the average? Um, optimally, yes. But in practice, people don't always do that because they rely upon heuristics for how other people are going to guess and guess numbers that are considerably higher than zero. So this is another game in which our sort of intuition for how things should be um, goes against what we should do optimally, because thinking through this logic is not what we do commonly, whereas coming up with ideas and heuristics about how people behave is something we do all the time to get through life. So this is a taste of bounded rationality. Um, uh, thank you very much.